Let's get right to work. Uh, Luke chapter 11, and we're going to read verses, well, verses 24 through 26. Luke 11, 24 through 26. For the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the reading of Luke 11, beginning at verse 24. It says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor. And repeat my subject. Say, neighbor, don't let it back in. Look at your neighbor on the other side. Say, neighbor, we play no games. <laughs> don't let it back in. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we all know today is Super Bowl Sunday, and this evening we will see two teams uh, compete for the national championship. And it's clear that we're going to see two different teams. We're going to have two different jerseys, two different helmets. Actually, the direction in which they'll be going will be opposite, so none of that will be confusing. It's interesting that when you see athletes compete on the football field or the basketball court or a, a baseball game or a soccer game or whatever competition that you may like, even tennis, you see that there is two separate entities opposing each other for victory. We know that we're in war with the devil. We know that we're in war with Satan himself. However, I'm not sure if we discern and identify how he moves into our lives. Because the one thing that Satan does very well is he disguises himself as an angel of light to get into your life because he realized that if he can't get into your life, he can't influence your life. I think that's why in Genesis chapter 3 is so interesting how the Bible says not Satan but the serpent was most cunning or the most cunning animal in the field or in the garden. He was cunning. Snakes are very, very smooth. They are very quiet. A snake can literally be by your foot and you don't even know it unless they make their presence known or unless you identify it. You know, a rattlesnake, for the most part, doesn't really rattle uh, its tail until he feels you're too close. But if he's trying to get you, then he will not shake his rattle. It's interesting how uh, it is actually known in, in Texas what would begin to happen is that rattlesnakes would, would, uh, 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 would shake their rattle and you know, people who would go through with, with horses and everything, they would hear the rattle and then they would go in different directions because of hearing the sound. And then the rattlesnakes got hip to it. And then what they began to do is they stopped rattling. So they knew that if they were going to get their opponent, that they could not make noise. And sometimes what the enemy will do is the enemy will turn off his rattle so that you're unable to identify he's that close. And so the cunningness of the serpent is something that the Satan thought was attractive. The Bible does not say that the serpent was Satan. It said that the serpent was most cunning. And I think Satan decided to influence the serpent because it had the attributes that highlighted what he was trying to accomplish. You have to be careful what attracts themselves to you. It could be that they see something in you that they feel can advance their cause. And so the Bible says that the serpent is crafty. He's cunning. In other words, he knows how to deceive in such a way. And so the Bible says that the serpent begins to have a conversation with Eve because he knew if I'm going to get to Adam, I have to go to where Adam's heart is. And Adam's heart is his wife, Eve. So when he deceived Eve to bite into the fruit, nothing happened. But the Bible says when she turned and then gave it to him and he ate, that the both of their eyes were open. The, the interesting thing about this is that the serpent knows how to position himself to get to you. If you're taking notes, you may want to write this down. The enemy gets into your life two ways. The first one is proximity. 
all he has to do is get close enough to you, hang out with you long enough for him to gain your trust. When he gains your trust, then you begin to open up. It's kind of like a cop going undercover uh, trying to take down a particular maybe drug operation or something. He stays there for years. He has to be a part of the, the crime. He has to be a part of what's going on to a degree so that he can gain the trust of the person he's trying to take down. Sometimes that happens years, seven years, ten years in before they can actually get in and bring the whole operation down. But how how do you do that? By gaining the trust of the person. So if Satan can get people around you or certain things around you, you will become comfortable just because it's in close proximity. This is why David was able to defeat Goliath is because he did not get close enough because the slingshot don't work up close. The slingshot only works from a distance. And you have to realize that if you're going to beat the next Goliath in your life, you're going to have to learn how to keep your distance. And so the Bible says that the serpent, he's cunning and he gets close. And so he gets in proximity and after he has a conversation with Eve, then everything begins to, to fall apart from there after giving it to Adam. So he comes through proximity. Who's close to you or what is close to you and what is trying to get into your space? What is trying to get into your heart? What is trying to get into your life at this very moment that the enemy is using to make you like it so that you can love it? And so we have to be careful of those things. And if we're not discerning, we will be unable to identify what's poisonous and what's dangerous to us because we like the attention or we like the company when the enemy is setting us up for failure. The second thing that he gets us is with access. First is proximity. Then the next thing is access. Is you opening yourself up for that. Opening yourself up for a relationship. You have to be careful about the things you do when you are low, when you are running on empty. You have to be careful and very cautious of that because the enemy will use the access to destroy you. I remember helping Nicholas with some homework, and I believe it is the Mandan Indians, or I, believe, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Mandan or Mandan Indians. And what would happen is the Indians would actually kill this particular uh, animal, but they realized they were too fast to get to. So what they started doing is they would kill the animal and then they would gut it and skin it. And then after they would let it dry and then they would put it on. And then they will go in the field looking like them, but not being them. And that's what the enemy does to us. He will present himself as someone who loves you, presents himself as somebody who supports you, present themselves as somebody who wants the best for you. But the whole intent is to take advantage of the situation by looking like something that they are not. It's, they're coming in, uh, uh, as we would say, they're wolves. In sheep clothing. You, I don't care how good they look. I don't care how wonderful they smell. I don't care how intelligent they may be. It could be a setup from the enemy, and you need discernment to identify the fact that this may be something that the enemy is positioning in your life so that he can hold you back from what God has called you to be and to do. And so it is that we have to understand that we're in spiritual warfare. And so it's easy to identify our opposition. It's easy to identify those who are against us. But how do you identify an enemy when you have similarities? How do you identify an enemy when you have similar interests? How do I know you're for me when we like the same thing? Why? How can I identify? It's called discernment and where God gives you, as it were, another set of eyes to see things that you wouldn't see with your natural eyes. And so it's, it's where we have to be careful because we don't realize these things are spiritual. And so the Bible begins to share with us how we're in spiritual warfare, how we're fighting against principalities and powers and, and spiritual wickedness and that our warfare is not carnal. It's not against a person, but it's with the spirit that dwells in the person. In order for Satan to have access in the earth realm, he has to have a body that somebody will give him access to reside in. So the serpent said, yes, you can use me. Then he got into the serpent. A spirit, it cannot operate in the earth without a body. So he has to have a body in which he, in, jealousy has to have a body to live in in order for you to know that jealousy exists. 
Envy has to have a body to live in in order for you to know that envy exists. Lust, pride, all those other things that people may deal with, it has to have a body to dwell in. What spirits are we wrestling with today that is not necessarily the devil trying to influence us, but certain things that have happened that now the enemy is not somebody I can look at. The enemy is me. Because that's the enemy we always have to deal with the one that you brush his teeth and you comb his hair and you, you wash his body and you clothe it and you bathe it and you feed it. That enemy, that one, that struggle that you have at the end of the day, I know you save and I know you love God and you come to church as much as you can and you read your Bible and you praying. But we all know there's something in all of us that the enemy will love to use to destroy us. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that the enemy knows where your weakness is. He knows where you are. He knows exactly what he can use to get to you. And so now we have to fight our own enemy. And the Bible says us, and actually in Romans chapter 7, Paul begins to write. He's the apostle Paul, the one who wrote letters to several churches, the one who established several churches. He spoke several languages, had several degrees. This man was uh, you know, of the top of the top of his class. He did it all. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, when I want to do good. Evil is always there. Y'all don't believe me? Let's go to Romans chapter 7. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7, around verse 14, verse 15, that he begins to, to write to the church at Rome. And when he's writing to them, he says, listen, I know you think a lot about me. Verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. Or in other words, I know I'm supposed to be doing the right thing, but I don't walk it out. I don't live it out. I know I'm not supposed to go here, say this, or participate in certain things. I know it, but I keep doing what I know I'm not supposed to do. And he loved Jesus. Okay. All right. So he says, but I don't practice it. And he says, but I hate that that I do. So now I'm doing stuff I shouldn't do. And the things I should do, I'm not doing and I hate it all, then I do what I will not to do, and I agree it's the law, that the law is, is good. Verse 17, but now it is no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells in me. This is the determining factor of, 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 of our struggle. How much sin do we allow to live and occupy in our space? Because sin is that thing that separates us from God. I know we live in a time and in a day where everyone says, oh, you can do this and do that. You know, you can, you can live in sin, do whatever you want. It's okay. God understands. He knows your struggle. And then over here, you still do what you want to do. It, it, doesn't work. it doesn't even work that way in human relationships. Why in the world do we think that it works in spiritual relationships? It doesn't work. God feels the same way. He says, you can't do this and that. He says, can bitter and sweet water come out the same fountain? He says, be ye separate, said the Lord. In other other words, if you're going to do me, let's, let's do this together, but you can't do me and that. That's why he says in 1 John, if the love of the world is in you, you do not have the love of the Father because you can't love the world and me at the same time. Remember, we're married to God, so God is saying you can't love me as your spouse and love the devil who's your sidekick. And then say, or, or your side piece, rather, and then say, oh, I'm good in that you can still go to each and every bed you decide to lay in on that particular day because your heart. That's why you got to be careful. I'm about to bust this bubble. This right here. Don't ever say this again. Don't ever say this again to somebody you dating. I will always love you. Don't say that. Don't say that because that's why some of y'all are in the predicament that you're in right now because you said, I will always love you. I don't love my ex-girlfriends no more. I don't love none of them. I only love you. Y'all not hearing me. See, if you start saying I love you, you might be setting yourself up to always love them even though you're not with them. So when you see them the next time, that always love, okay, y'all, that always love pop up. Be careful. We say things, it sounds nice in the moment. Sounds great, but practical, that it holds you back. And so Paul is saying, I'm struggling because I want to do the right thing, but it's the sin that's in me. This is why we thank God for what he did. In verse 23, he says, but I see another law in my members or in my body, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. So in other words, my body wants to do this. My mind is saying, stay away. Have you ever been there when your body was like, yes, 
Let's do this. Let's go. It's going to happen. And your mind's saying, slow down. Get out of there. Don't do it. Don't say it. Don't, don't answer the phone. And your hand is like, your mind's like, don't answer it. Don't answer it. Don't answer it. You're going, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> you're trying to figure out what you're going to do. And you're like, well, then, hello. And, and, and now, and, and, and so you get on this, and it's interesting how you'll be on the phone, and you're like, I should not be on this call. Hang up right now. Lie and say the call dropped. Do something, but you don't do it, but you keep holding on. Why? Because you're a member. Your body is saying yes, but your mind is saying back up, don't do it. And it's always a fight. And this fight is not a satanic fight necessarily, more than it is a fight between what God has told you to do and what you're not supposed to do. And the war is in your, in your flesh, it's in your spirit, and you have World War Me going on. So what happens when you want your purpose, but yet you love your past? Yesterday, I, I don't know, the Lord just shows me things, and, and you know, I appreciate it. So yesterday, we were at the house, and Bree picked up two of her baby dolls, and she's carrying around, and then she has her little cell phone, and she picked up her little cell phone, and, and then she saw something else, and then she went and picked that up, and then she saw something else, and then she picked that up, and when she went to pick that up, her phone fell. And so then she picked up her phone and then tried to pick up the other thing, and her phone fell again. And so then she picked the phone up, and then she tried to reach down to pick it up. Then her phone and the baby doll fell. She picked up the baby doll, then the phone, then she went to reach for it, then it fell again. And then eventually she just put everything down to pick up the one thing she was looking for. See, here's the challenge. See, the reality is you can't hold on to everything. Sometimes you have to put what's in your hand down to get where you're trying to go. Now, the question is this. The question is this. Do you need to pay attention to what you have in your hand and leave that on the ground? Or do you need to put what's out of your hand out of your hand to reach what you need next? Whatever you are in that situation, the reality is this. You can't have what you have and get what you're trying to get at the same time. You're going to have to let something go. What do you have to let go? It may not be, it may not always be friends. It may be bad attitudes, a mindset, a mentality, a, 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 a perception of life that you need, to, you need to handle and address. But whatever it is, you got to realize it's a war going on in the inside of me. So you end up becoming your worst enemy. Have you ever gotten in your own way? Absolutely. We, we, we've done things like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have did that. I shouldn't have said that because we got in our own way. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who would deliver me from this body of death? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, Jesus is the one that gives us the ability to get over and to conquer the sin that's in this body. That's why he died, so that we can have power over the, the works of the enemy, so that we could walk like he walked. See, we want to be like Jesus, which means we need to walk like Jesus, live like Jesus, talk like Jesus. But the only way we can do it is we got to have the spirit Jesus had in order to live the life that Jesus lived. Right. So when we look at this, he dies. So now when we look at the enemy, we can say, I'm not going to do that because Jesus had power over his flesh. When he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's getting ready to die, Jesus didn't die on Calvary first. He died in Gethsemane first because if he didn't die in Gethsemane, he would have never made it to Calvary. Some people see your public death and think you died there. They don't realize you died months and years and days earlier. And so you got to die for for it before you die for it. Now, you have to give up some things before you start giving up some things. What people see, they don't realize that's old news for you because you gave that up long ago. And so this is why Jesus came so that we could have dominion and power over the earth. This is the thing that we messed up with people in church is because we think church is simply the place we come, hear a message, feel good, give our tithes and offerings and go home and that's it. When God is literally trying to change the way you think about the way we live. Jesus did not come to preach a good message. Jesus came to position us back to where we were supposed to be. When Adam ate the fruit, he got 
kicked out of the garden and he lost dominion. That's when the, the power transfer happened and then Satan became the prince of the darkness of the air. And so now he began to have some level of influence in the world. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 2, the people who operate under the spirit of disobedience, under the hand of the enemy. So now when we have Jesus in our lives, there are certain things we can address because he gave us our dominion back. It's kind of like this. If I took your sweater and I took it because uh, I tricked you out of it, then what happens your daddy comes and then says, no, he's going to give him his sweater back and then he ends up taking it off from me and then gives it back to you. Now you can wear your sweater because a transaction happened to give back to you what you should have never lost in the first place. Are you with me? So when we come to church, God is saying you're supposed to have dominion or influence or have a domain. This is why the enemy doesn't want the church or even you to own property because you get to control what happens in your property. Y'all not saying nothing to me. If you come to my house, you're under the Mutri domain and you have to do what the Mutris do at our house. I don't care what you do outside this house, but once you walk in this house, you're going to do what we do. That's why kids don't like their parents because they don't always like what has to happen in that domain. Y'all got quiet. In this house, you're going to clean your room. In this house, you're going to wash them dishes. In this house, you're going to do what you're supposed to do. In this house, you're going to do your homework. In this house, you're going to go to bed when I say go to bed. In this house, you're going to get up when I say get up. In this house, you're going to take the trash out. In this house, you're going to brush your teeth. In this house, you're going to wash your body. Now, you leave here and don't do that. That's on you. But when you're here, you're going to do what's in this domain. God is saying, I'm trying to give you the same dominion that when you start your business, People can't walk up into your place of employment and start starting foolishness. You say, no, 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 we got this domain. Either you get with the program or you go through the door. He wants us to have dominion. Somebody say dominion. So the enemy is trying to fight us because he doesn't want us to know where God really wants us to be. So you go and you miss it and you just go to church. That's why church doesn't seem to make sense. Because you feel like it's more, but the only thing we keep doing is preaching hope and not giving you the tools to fight. See, there, there, there's an interesting thing about when you see the children of Israel, when they come out of Exodus, everybody who's fighting them in the wilderness is holding them back from where they're supposed to be. <laughs> but when you get in Joshua, they're not fighting, listen, to get somewhere. They're trying to get what they're getting what already belongs to them. You're still fighting, but you're fighting for two different reasons. Do you even know why you're fighting? Because sometimes you may be trying to get somewhere and you're already there. But if you don't understand where you are and why you're fighting, you could be fighting for the wrong reasons and for the wrong thing. And so here it is. God is trying to help us. And he says, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Jesus, who is our Lord. He's the one who's going to deliver me. This is why we give praise to God. Because if he didn't do what he did, we couldn't do what we do. The only reason why you didn't go off is because you had Jesus. The only reason why you still got that job and holding on to that little piece of check that you still have that you really want to get is because you have Jesus. You know good and well you are not that nice but just because God has been gracious he covered you and he began to cover your flaws and your, your issues and your weaknesses and you gotta thank God because if he didn't give you the grace that he's given you you will not be in the place you are today I need somebody to say I know that's right Jesus did it. And so that's why when we come to church, we give him praise because we know if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be where we are. But we forget it because we think he's supposed to give us a bunch of blessings when we're supposed to be taken over. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to have so much resources as a church, hear me, that if something were to happen in our city that we don't have to go out and ask for government assistance. That the church has enough power and enough equity and enough influence and enough capital that we could do something ourselves without going to the world to ask for it. But what we do is we give all of our wealth to the world and we won't give it to God and then turn around and look at the church and say, yeah, I don't do nothing. When you just spent X number of dollars to give to somebody who worships the devil instead of giving it to somebody who's trying to upbuild the kingdom of God. I know you're quiet, but I'm going to give through this and so 
we got to change the way we think about church and about God. And the enemy wants to struggle to continue in our lives. But how do you handle it when you're the one struggling? So then in Luke chapter 11, the Bible says that Jesus is literally casting out of a cast out of spirit. The guy had a mute spirit. He was not talking, began to talk. The people began to judge him and say, wait a minute. The only reason why he was able to cast this devil out is because he has the spirit of Beelzebub himself. In other words, the reason why Jesus is able to cast out a devil is because he is a devil. So Jesus comes back and says, that's foolishness. Even Satan knows that a kingdom divided against itself can't stand. The devil knows how important unity is. He understands that everybody has to be on the same page. And now you're telling me that I'm demon possessed or I'm influenced by Beelzebub because I cast out a demon. It's interesting if somebody over there cast out a devil, you wouldn't be questioning his authority, but you question mine. You see, some people will question you because they don't think you need to have it. They would rather somebody else have it and rather somebody else have the influence and, and all of the perks and all that. But God will choose you. I don't know why I'm here, but God will give you favor and bless you with stuff that other people wish they had. And you saying, I didn't even ask for this. I didn't even want this. I wasn't seeking for it. I wasn't looking for it. God just gave it to me. But since he gave it to me, I might have to use it because I want to stand before him. And he said, you've done good and faithful, my servant. I want God to say it. And so he begins to talk about it. So he says, listen, he says, if a man has a spirit and he's strong, if he's strong, he can protect his house based on his own strength. He says, and the only way another man can take over his house is if somebody else comes that is stronger. So the reason why some of us are losing the battle of our lives is because we keep feeding the wrong thing. And so it allows what we should be beating to beat us because we keep feeding the thing that keeps defeating us. You can't continue to feed your flesh and do everything you want to do in your flesh and then think you're going to get ahead spiritually. That's the challenge we have. So for seven, six days a week, we sow into worldly things. And then we come just for an hour to think that this one hour is just going to be so life-changing that everything is going to change within 35 minutes. And God is like, no, I came, I called you here so you could get equipped to know what to do on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and on Sunday. And so no matter what you do, you have it every Every day. So this is not something I live an hour. This is something I live 24 7. So here it is. So now Jesus says the only way the spirit can overtake is if another spirit or another person is stronger than me to take over where I am. So then he goes to verse 24 of Luke 11. He says when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, right, when the spirit leaves, he goes into dry places. He looks in dry places and he is seeking rest. So here it is. The spirit that was now uh, evicted is now looking for rest. He had rest when he was in your life. But now that they're out of your life, now they're restless. Uh, but if I could insert something here, and I believe I wouldn't be wrong, is this. Is that... Um, I was restless when you were here. And now I have peace when you're gone. But now you're trying to get back to make me restless so that you can have the peace you want. It's kind of like baby boy. You know, Jody. You know, you driving my car, eating my cereal, drinking my orange juice while I'm at work. Jody ain't thinking about changing at all because he has what he wants because he ain't nothing but a big baby. I, I help me. So now you need to let Jody go because if you don't let Jody go, you will have a baby by Jody and Jody ain't going to work for you or that. Y'all ain't here saying he ain't going to do him nothing because you love Jody. You See, that's the problem. You love how Jody make you feel, but up here you saying Jody ain't no good for me. See, you love the way he loves you, but you don't like, you know, good and well Jody ain't had a job in six years. You, 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 you know he's driving your car. You happy he vacuumed it and put, and he shines your rims and he waxed your 
car. He only wax that car and shine your rims because while he's driving, while you working, everybody think that's his car. I'm sorry. So the reason why he does that is because it makes him look good. And so you're sitting here restless and they're sitting there restful and they're sleeping while you working and you only looking at how it makes you feel in the moment. But if you never get over your flesh, you would stay and compromise and be stuck to somebody. And I'm talking more than about brothers. There's some sisters, too, who will only hang out with you just to get into your pockets and, so, and just try to get. So as long as you buying them stuff and you treating them nice and you giving them money for their hair and their nails and you paying their bills. Oh, they love you. Stop paying that. I ain't your husband. I'm sorry. You get your own job. You pay your own bills. That's like he need to get his own car. In his own place, y'all yeah, got quiet on me. It, it's interesting because I got to deal with this spirit because we're compromising our standards because we love the way it feels in the moment. That person will not be good for you in five years. Woo. That person is not going to be good for you. You're going to be struggling. Why? Because your flesh, hear me. See, you better be careful because... Your mind sometimes can take you places and make you start imagining things that are not even real because you have to dream because you hate your present condition and then you convince that it's going to get better and you have a faith that God going to turn this around in your favor. So now you're using your faith against you. Because now you want to use God and faith to get what you want when you know you need to use that faith to move on. So the Bible says that this, this spirit seeks rest and he can't, he can't find it and he can't find us. So what does he do? He comes back and he finds the same house. Look at it in verse 24. He comes back and the house, excuse me, in verse 25, is swept and put in order. Okay, so when you were in my life, it was chaotic. <laughs> when, when you were present, everything was all over the place. I couldn't get my grip. I couldn't think straight. I was losing myself. I, I thought I was losing my mind. I couldn't do nothing right. Now you gone. I see clearly now. I can see clearly now. I can, see, I can see clearly now. You're not in. I'm feeling good about myself. I see my dreams. They're actually good. I'm going to start walking this thing out. Then all of a sudden, the phone rings. That phone again. And all of a sudden, you got, oh, should I answer? My question is, why did you not block them when they left? See, there's, I'm going to tell you now, there's some people in my phone, if you ever got my phone, there's actually people that are blocked, and there's actually some DNAs. Do not answer. Yeah, yeah. I don't, <laughs> oh, pastor, that's rough. That's the God on the truth. There's some, I don't want to ever have a conversation with you ever again in my, yeah, y'all don't, some people don't mean you good. They only tell you what you want to hear so they can get back so you can be restless because that person brought chaos. See, people who love chaos are drama. They're attracted to drama. It's always something going on. Something always do, somebody always did some, something bad to them. Somebody always did you dirty. Somebody always stabbed you in the back. How many knives you got? Either, either you crazy or you just have a bad discernment on selecting friends. But the truth of the matter is you kept dating the same person. Or you kept connecting with the same person. The only thing that changed was their name. Because spirits attract. Y'all don't like this kind of teaching. See, the reason why you like that is because that's in you. See, see, we don't like to deal with the real issue because we deal with the side effects and not the real cause of stuff. See, you take medicine, they say, if you take this medicine, you're going to have diarrhea, and you're going to have, you're going to have headaches, and you're going to have bloatness, and you're going to swell, and you're going to sweat, and you're going to get hot, and you have hot flashes, and all that. And so now, you go into the person to get help, and what's wrong with you? I have hot flashes, and I got, no, that's side effects. That's, that's not really the issue. So the reason why we can't get delivered is because we keep asking God to deliver us from side effects and not the root cause. If you deal with the root cause, you won't have the side effects. 
The reason why Samson went blind is because of a root called Delilah. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? If he fixed Delilah, he would have had his eyes. So here it is. So, so we don't like this. I was sharing with the first church, and I don't say this in a derogatory way. It was actually, you got to understand what spirit is in you and what, how strong is that spirit? How, like, how strong is that spirit? I was sharing with the first service, there was a gentleman who was actually attracted uh, to, to men. He was attracted to the men. He was going to a church, at a church service, and a, a lady was in front of him, and uh, praise and worship was going on, you know. She's singing, she waved her hands, lifted and everything. And he said to someone I knew, he said, I'm attracted to men, but the spirit on her so strong, she might make me straight. Now, what kind of spirit do you have on you? <laughs> now, if it's a struggle for the guy who's attracted to men, how strong is that going to be for a man who's already attracted to women? Yeah. That's the woman you don't want by your husband. That's why some folk don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> You, you don't want that kind of man. That's the kind you take your wife. Come on, let's go. We're leaving. Why? Because you know. See, because you think you're nice. You ain't nice. You're flirtatious. And you, you fail to it. Y'all got quiet. Y'all got, what's the root cause? I just, I think the Lord is anointing me. That ain't an anointing. Because we want to anoint everything now. Let me get back to my, we, everything is an anointing. Oh, yeah, such and such. Oh, this rapper is anointed. This R&B singer is, I heard somebody, I'm sorry. Swept and put in order, okay. Anointed means someone who has been empowered by God to, to do something. So if the person is empowered by God and they're leading you away from God, that is not an anointing. You like the way they make you feel. So because we don't know what the anointing is, that's why it's so easy to get people to come to church. All you got to do is make them feel. That's why we have secret friendly churches. Those are churches that make you. I'm, gonna say, I'm serious. I'm just being honest with you. We want a big church. We want a mega church. We want to look good. So what they do is we water everything down to, so that you're comfortable in the sin that you actually live in. But then you can say, oh, I came to church. But there is no standard. They won't preach on sin. They won't preach on what you need to change. They won't teach on things that will let you grow. They teach you at a place that feeds you where you are and keeps you complacent spiritually. And you like that church because there's no power there. It just makes you feel good. Seeker friendly. And that's why people will look at other churches and say, oh, they only go on there because they make them feel good. Some churches are growing because some churches make them feel good. Other churches are growing because the word is actually going forth and people are going there because they're being fed. You got to have discernment to know the difference. So he says, all right, verse 26, I got to get out of here. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. Oh, my God. See, we need to learn the difference between weaknesses and wicked. Some people are wicked. Some people are weak. So did you fall into that because you were wicked or did you fall in that because you were weak? And we have a tendency to want to judge people for a weakness. Well, you got to handle wickedness different than how you handle weakness. You don't restore the wicked. You restore the weak. And if you start paying attention to wicked folk, you are actually casting your pearls among swine because they ain't never going to change because in their heart they're just straight up wicked. Okay. He gets seven more devils stronger than himself, and by the time they're done, this person is in a worse condition than they were before. This is why it's harder for you to leave now, because you let them back in too many times. I don't think this is going to work out. You know what? This is over. I'm done. You know what? I don't need to do this, whether it's a business partner, whether it's family, whatever. See, because some t- listen. Sometimes you got to put family in a place. Oh, yeah. Sometimes, I don't care. They can be your first cousin. Nope, you go in this box right over here. And when you get your mind right, then I'll talk to you. Otherwise than that, you over there. Y'all don't like this kind of preaching, do you? 
know you got to put people in their place because you can't allow people to stress you out over their foolishness because they bring chaos to your life. And when you live in chaos for so long, you begin to think that chaos is actually order. So then somebody else has to come and tell you that's not order, that's chaos. And they have to teach you what order looks like. And then when you get in order and other people try to bring chaos, you tell them I'm not doing that. Then they say to you, you changing, you doggone right. I'm in order and you in chaos and I'm not going to chaos because I'm in order. He says the spirit comes in is stronger than ever. Here it is. I got to stop because I'm out of time. He says it's is out of, is stronger than it's ever been because it invited seven more devils. Stronger than the one you kicked out. So this is over. We can't do this. We can't go any further. Okay, fine. It hurt you a little bit. Took you a week after you sat on the couch. <sighs> Ate chocolate, listened to sad music, all that. You got over it. So then all of a sudden, you're making progress, you're feeling better about yourself, your life is getting together. And what happens is this, hear me, please hear me. When you start coming up, and when everything starts getting better for you, then they want to call back. Because now they realize the only reason why they were able to get to where they were was because they was connected to you. So now, but here it is. This is what happens. Hear me. So while you're coming up, they call you. If you accept it, what happens is this. You come down. This is why when you're driving up hills, it takes more work to go up the hill. But you got to press the brakes when you're coming down the hill because you pick up speed when you're coming down. It is easier to come down. It is harder to go up. So why in the world put all of that hard work in just to give it up? For somebody who's going to pull you right back down to the place that you were. And so now it's harder because as time begins to progress, you're not trying to get here. You're trying to get here. But now you got to work twice as hard. So the enemy wants you to do. What does the enemy want to do now? He wants us to stay in a cycle of letting people in, letting them go, letting them in, letting them go. Letting them in. And that's why you've been messing with certain people. I don't know why I'm here. And this is why some of y'all been messing with people for like 10 and 15 years and ain't nothing, nothing ever happened. Because you're letting them in, letting them go, letting them in, letting them go, letting them in, letting them go. What, you going to stay or you leaving? Which one we doing? Because this back and forth. See, this one you got to put your foot down and say, look, are we going to do something with this or not? Are we going to start this business? Are we going what, what to, what are we doing here? Because you're just wasting my time. Sometimes, listen, okay, let me take it off this way. Sometimes, brothers, you can have a friend who's a male, good friend. Y'all grew up, you know, we grew up using diapers together back at home. Don't care. That person may be very, it could be a detriment to your progression. It doesn't mean you hate them. It means you put them in a place that doesn't affect your order. I have some friends I went to school with. I told you this, and I'm going to stop. We went to school. I told you about this. Went, went to my, 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 my uh, homecoming one, one year. Um, they all came down, came from you know, New Jersey and Atlanta and Charlotte, and everybody was coming down. I said, yo, Sam, let's, let's hang up again. I said, oh, man, I would love to see you guys. So I asked Leslie, hey, you, do you mind if I go down? She said, no, nah, not a problem at all. We had just at the church. I remember that. You just, it was like seven years ago. So we went down. I went down to Orangeburg on a Saturday night, which was crazy. Went down there on a Saturday because <laughs> I had to preach. And so I went down there and so met up. We had to, so we ate at the Ch Chinese restaurant. We talking and laughing and everything is good. And then um, they said, yo, I'm going to the hotel. I need to change for the, 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 the party or whatever they was going to. I said, okay, so no problem. So I'll, I'll meet the other guys up there at the hotel, no problem. So we went up there and he said, all right. So he opened up his trunk. He said, can you help me take some of the stuff up to the room? I said, no problem. This joker pulls out a 12-pack, six-pack, something. A whole case of beer and said, take this. I said, are you serious? I said, man, you know I'm a pastor. I ain't taking no case of beer to your room. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry about that, dog. I forgot. I thought he was in 96. Yeah, you dog. <laughs> man, give me your suitcase or something. So he gave me that, and I took that. I was so mad. Then I walk in the room, and they wilding out like this 97. I said, it was good seeing all of y'all. 
love you, bye, and left because I couldn't open that door, Helene. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying? It was good to see them. I love y'all, but y'all got to stay over there because if I do, y'all can pull me down. Next thing you know, I'm going to be on Instagram, and you can see me with something. And it's, y'all, ain't, y'all got quiet on this side in the back. I'm going to pray for y'all. It, it's interesting. You can find yourself in something. You can be like, oh, my God. Then your whole reputation is messed up, and now you got to go back home. And, baby, that ain't what really happened. Nah, I ain't got to do none of that. I'm going to leave you where you are, love you, and mean it. But you can't pull me back down because if you come down, it's harder to get out of it. So you can't let it back in. I don't care how fine she is. Don't let, I don't know who this is for. Don't let it back in. I don't care if your business partner saying, I think we got something. I, I hear clearly, don't fool up with them. They c- Are they coming back because they need you? Or are you willing to talk about it because you feel there's something that's beneficial? Every relationship has to have deposits and withdrawals. But it can't always be withdrawals on one side and not deposits. That leaves you restless and frustrated and in a place of chaos. God wants you free. I got to stop them over time and we will have a problem in the parking lot already. So listen, I want you to stand to your feet.